Well, hello and welcome to my Dialorama's Top Picks. I'm Abla Kanzlaft, film programmer, journalist and researcher with my co-host Coco Green, armchair critic and aspiring academic. In Top Picks, we discuss marginalisation, resistance and some of the isms in drama, documentary, mystery and independent films and series. Now, in its 11th year, My Dai champions independent film and it's used as a platform for underrepresented and often ignored voices. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at My Dialorama, and you can like us, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Short link is mydie.link slash Apple or Spotify, mydie.link slash Spotify, and support us with either one time or monthly donation at mydie.link slash donate. You can also subscribe to our newsletter for uh, goodies and discount codes and the likes at mydie.link slash subscribe. So our guest this week is Anna Smith. Anna is a leading film critic and broadcaster in the UK. She is the host of the very popular podcast Girls on Film, a fun feminist film show that shines a light on female filmmakers and film critics. Girls on Film was instantly listed as the best feminist film podcast by Stylist magazine and has attracted uh, many guests, including Rosamund Pike, Kerry Mulligan, Amma Sante and Linda Hamilton. Anna also contributes to Deadline Hollywood, Time Out, Metro and The Guardian and appears regularly on Radio 4 and Sky TV and often stands in for Mark Kermode on the BBC News Channel Film Review. Um, Anna was also the former president of the UK Critic Circle. And I'll leave some uh, information about where you can find her online in the blurb below. So this week, uh, we will chat about women as lead characters in sexually charged noir films from the 90s to the present day, to the new spate of films that belong to what Anna calls bubblegum noir, using the film Promising Young Woman as a starting point. Um, but before that, we'd like to maybe flag a couple of recommendations for this week. So I have a couple. Anna, do you have anything that you'd like to recommend? Any films or series that you've seen this week? I've just been talking to Joanna Scanlon this morning for our next episode on Girls on Film. And she's in a fantastic film called After Love about um, a white British woman who converts to Islam and then um, her husband dies and she finds out he was having an affair. And she goes out looking for that woman, a French woman. So it's kind of a thriller but with lots of kind of racial tension and a kind of feminist theme so i definitely recommend after love oh nice uh what will be shown on i think you'll be able to get it online and in cinemas so it's a bfi release so yeah check it out oh thank you very much for that brilliant uh we'll put uh, some more information in the blurb and possibly a link to where you can find it socorro do you have any recommendations no i just have a long list of things that i plan to watch that didn't happen <laughs> so next week Okay, well, that's fine. Uh, for me, very briefly, just a couple of things I'd like to flag. So uh, in light of current news, I won't really go into it, but um, thanks to the Arab Film and Media Institute, we've got uh, all the works of uh, Palestinian director Elias Suleiman, which are available to view online. So it's a film retrospective, bringing his award-winning films to the internet. And uh, it kicked off on 21st of May. And they're all, all his films are available to watch uh, video on demand style uh, for free. So I'll uh, put a link to that at the bottom. And the other thing that I've been watching that I really, really like and uh, really recommend is an HBO series called Mayor of Easttown. So as you know, I'm a huge crime drama fan. I find it so, so therapeutic to watch at the moment. So this is my new crime drama miniseries. Uh, it's created by Brad Inglesby and it stars uh, Kate Winslet as a detective investigating the murder of a teenage mum in a town near Philadelphia called East Town. It's, uh, it's very good. The acting's brilliant. It's very bleak, but uh, it has <laughs> surprisingly um, very funny moments that are just, just tonally right. Um, and I think it's mostly due to the strength of the acting that it works so well. Um, so proper slapstick interspersed in this kind of very dark uh, crime drama. Uh, so really recommend it. And I was really impressed with Kate Winslet's American accent. And that's uh, that's it for, for us. So we're going to be discussing um, this this kind of genre, I guess, of uh, bubblegum noir. Uh, Anna, would you like to explain a little bit more about how you coined that phrase? 
Well, in the 90s, I was very interested in sort of dissecting films like The Last Seduction, um, Basic Instinct and To Die For. They're, they're quite diverse in some ways, but all of them have a female lead who is um, very sexually charged, very confident. She's basically a con artist, um, but she is also the, the sort of stereotypical femme fatale in a noir film, kind of updated from the 40s and 50s. So that was a bit of a trend then. Um, and then I've noticed that recently we've seen that kind of character coming back in um, mainstream and art house thrillers, um, but with a different spin. So films like I Care A Lot, starring Rosamund Pike, um, I Blame Society, from Gillian Wallace Horvath, and to a slightly different degree, Promising Young Woman, starring Kerry Mulligan, um, we're seeing, I think, arguably more of a female gaze on this topic, which interests me, but also a slightly lighter, um, brighter take. Um, and and the, the reason I, I call it bubblegum noir is because the, I think the visual aesthetic is is very different here. Um, it's it's not the kind of greys and, and, and shadows and, and, and black and whites that we see of, of the old noir films. This is bright, social media influenced, colourful noir. So it's almost a contradiction in terms, which is why I like to call it that. Oh, that's really interesting. So it's yeah, a reference to the uh kind of oversaturated colours which uh, Promising Young Woman's a really good example of she's very and I thought that was an interesting touch that she's very made up isn't she she wears uh, very colourful makeup you know different nail varnish colour on each finger that sort of thing um, which I found I found told its own story about the character um, how did you why did you want to use that specific film as a starting point well, I think it's a really important film, and not only has it been um, highly awarded in the last award season, but it seems to have touched a nerve with a lot of people. Um, on a serious note, obviously, it speaks to a very current issue or a long-standing issue, mm -hmm. as we all know, which is the safety of women, um, because Kerry Mulligan's character is playing a woman who's um, trying to call out men who are taking advantage of drunk women or women who appear to be drunk in nightclubs. Um, and that it's, it's about consent, basically, um, and exploitation. And that seems to be something very current, which um, we've also seen on TV explored recently. Um, and I May Destroy You. And um, so I thought that was really interesting. On, on Girls on Film, we did a special episode mm -hmm. around this where we spoke to a former police chief and we yeah. spoke to activists um, you know, who, who've worked in the area of women's safety for a long time and obviously recognise that this is a very, very serious issue. But I found it interesting that um, this is a film which I think is designed to appeal perhaps equally to men and women because it's also a very fun film. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in films that do use the kind of almost sexy thriller format to actually tell a serious feminist message. And of course, this comes from a female writer, director, Emerald Fennell. Um, so I, I feel like Emerald is, is sort of harnessing what has been in the past, perhaps more of a male um, genre, which has been sexualizing these women and turning it into something perhaps more empowering, albeit slightly dispiriting at the same time. Yeah. Um, talking about dispiriting, that's something that's been... Uh... I've read some reviews criticising the... Ed Spoiler alert, mm. we're just going to have to... Um, usually we assume any listeners will have seen the films we're talking about. Um, but uh, some of the reviews were... Um, th thought that it was it was counterproductive to have her die at the end. It kind of um, killed the point it was trying to make. Um, I'm not sure I agree because I'm with you on the fact that it is ultimately a fun film and it's very entertaining and it's very dramatic. And I felt that that was her dying at the end was kind of more part of the dramatic arc than trying to make a point about anything. Um, so I didn't feel like it distracted from its general message. Um, so I don't know about, you know, both of you. Um, and what did you make of the ending? Were you disappointed to to have her die at the end or not? I was from an enjoyment perspective because obviously we're used to seeing the women triumph and walk away scot-free in these kind of films. Um, and I was initially expecting that, so it was a shock. But at the same time, I do have some admiration for that. And as, I, as you say, it, it serves a dramatic purpose, even though there are a lot of 
technical questions about oh really would the police actually have raced along just because you know he, they received this information there's there's lots of you know perhaps yeah. plot points you could question but i think it has a huge dramatic impact that final scene is, is at the wedding is extraordinary especially with that music um and i have seen an argument people saying well i think it was emerald Fennell herself saying well this is the reality unfortunately most of these crimes go unpunished and the whole point of the title is it's a play on promising young man. Oh, he's a promising young man. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we should we should preserve his career and his promise and, and, and let him get away with rape, basically. Um, so I think it was an acknowledgement. You could read it as an acknowledgement of the fact that that, you know, most women are let down by the law uh, in this scenario and that Cassie paid the ultimate price to get justice for her friend. Yeah, I agree. That's how I felt. And also, you're right, from a purely dramatic point of view, I thought it would be doubtful whether the police would actually turn up like this in such a dramatic manner at a funeral to arrest someone purely based on a the wedding. release of this yeah. footage. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Cora, what did, what did you make of it? Yeah, no. The I, film in general and the ending. Okay, well, so as far as the ending is true, I mean, I... I thought they just did that for timeline purposes and for dramatic effect because it was funny that she, <laughs> the messages came through after she died. And you're like, oh, wait, she thought that she might not make it out alive. Super. Because you weren't quite sure after they were burning the body and got away with it. Um, but I did think that she did have to die because that was the only way she was going to get justice. I mean, I think the film, and that's what I was thinking about throughout the film, is I wasn't quite sure what the point was was because on the one hand she you know she pretended to be drunk to see which man was going to you know rape her essentially so date rape her but then she would respond with violence even though they actually never did so it was what they were attempting to do and it's like well is that the response that you want to do as violence and then she was also pretty violent like she busted out people's car I, I like what she did to the dean though that was quite deserving and, and not violent right so it's like so she was able to get back at the woman without being violent but with the men mm -hmm. she had to be violent so they didn't quite reconcile that um but they did toy with this idea about what is justice then because if you can't get it through the courts what's another way to get justice and I think she realized that everyone else moved on because even the young, her best friend's mother wasn't that bothered. She's like, ah, eh, you need to move on now. So her, she was, her family wasn't even fighting for her. And she's the one still stuck in that place and saying, no, we have to get justice. And I thought it was just an indictment of the system to say, well, death is the only way to get justice. Like I'm very reluctant to tie this white woman's story to a black lives matter thing. But I think it's something to consider of, what gets people moving towards justice people have to die whereas the injustice happens every day mm -hmm. with living people and they have a social death so social death people aren't so bothered but the actual death people are and i thought it was saying something about that like someone has to die to get people to take action and moving even though i'm sure he'll find mm -hmm. a way to get off because he seems like he has access to very expensive legal representation and <laughs> the wedding was supposed to be really huge as well too so i i think he'll still figure out a way to get out of that nevertheless it's, well, that's interesting. Yeah, that's how I viewed it as well. That's why I um, I think the uh, critique on the Roger Ebert website was the one I was referring to. Which oh, I didn't was read it. What did it, it was specifically damning of, of the ending, of the fact that it was disempowering to have her die at the end. Um, and I thought for all those reasons that we mentioned that I didn't quite agree with that. No, um, she there's... had to die because e either way, right, either that or she was going to go to jail because her boy or her ex-boyfriend, he looked like he'd be easy to roll over. He's very much wants to protect his life and career. Yeah. So he was going to turn her into the authorities. Had she been successful in carving her name into his chest, she would have gone to prison. So it's like, well, <laughs> would we prefer a social death for her or an actual death? And then you get some someone at least gets held accountable. Yeah, that's it. There's something more, sadly, I guess, quite powerful about that. Um, there's something I want to just go back to what you said about her exacting um, quite violent revenge on these men. So well, I was chatting to, to my husband about it. Um, we, we were discussing the film after viewing it and uh, he really liked it as well. Um, but he did say a potentially a, a more daring film or a braver film. I disagree because I didn't think that was the point of the film. First of all, it's a dramatic, entertaining film, a revenge film. So I didn't agree that that level of nuance or whatever was needed. But he said 
um, he would have liked to see situations where actually there are grey areas and it's not clear cut and then you question that reaction. So in the film, every instance that she finds herself uh, herself in, there is transgression by the man, right? He acts inappropriately. Um, there is an, a case where, she, well, that's also because she pretends to be drunk, so she's fully conscious. But he said, well, basically, it would have been interesting to see where there is sort of ex- explicit consent, but um, hiding the fact that maybe the woman's not really into it, uh, that the signs that the man's not reading, things where it can quickly become something that's much more murky. And then um, what are the consequences of that? So, I mean, I personally don't think that was the point of the film. Yeah, I, I think that's but, a different film. And I, I do think that yeah. is a really interesting area that is highlighted. And it's something we've talked about on Girls on Film. Films like St. Maud explore that briefly, yes. um, although it, it, the scene in St. Maud is, does end up turn into a rape scene. But um, I, I think that's really interesting. But I don't, I think you're right, Abla. I think it was this film's intention to be quite you know extreme and and to show the unfortunate reality that basically any man that is going to pick up that girl in that state Mm -hmm. or that perceived state he has the worst of intentions that's it that's it you you from the start a man who was genuine about his intentions wouldn't have picked her up seeing just how passed out she was really how out of he would have seen her home without exploiting that situation or found her friends or whatever no, and that's just it. He easily could have dropped her off because she set up this in the first scene. She sets it up so that she is able to give her address. And she also feigns like she might throw up in the car, in which case you're like, OK, let's get her out of this Uber as quickly as possible so we don't have the $150 fee. And he's the one, right? So she sets it up to where you have everything possible to just drop me off. And he went out of his way like, no, no, come to my house and have another drink. So not even come to my house and like put her to bed and then seduce her in the morning, which is fine. But no, 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 no. He wants he wants her just so she's not totally incapacitated. Yeah, yeah. that's it. So he was the worst. And <laughs> I think it's, and, and those are, I, I mean, I think the example uh, your husband was talking about, I think those are outlier situations. And I thought what this film was trying to do was really give you a sense that it's the whole system. So it's not even about these um, incidents. It is about everyone who protects them. So it's it's about the dean. It was the lawyer. It was the friends, people who, you know, who she thought were her friends at the time. Um, And just a culture and environment where you find ways to normalize it. Mental gymnastics, whatever you have to do, because it's like, well, no, I'd I'd rather choose not to believe that. Or, or, or. It's, you know, finding everything wrong. Like with the uh, lawyer, how he talked about what you have to assassinate her character, which is his job as a defense attorney at the same time. Like, why is that even relevant to the situation? Right. Unless she's a blackmailer, why would her sex, you know, her sexual history come into play? But that's the way. um, Yeah, the way it's all set up. So I thought that was what she was more trying to point to versus the intricacies of an encounter. Yeah, I agree. But I also, and that's why we got on to discussing the systemic implications. So my argument was that I would, um, when we were talking about the the situations where there are more discrete, I guess, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's awful saying this, but for want of a better phrase, but more discrete signs that uh, the woman isn't, isn't, isn't into it, um, And the man's not reading those signs. And I feel like that's also a a discussion that should be had. Why is it that so many women feel that that's the kind of situation that's acceptable to be in? I think it's interesting to look at the history of film and the influence that film and media have on young men. And, you know, perhaps to agree pornography, but let's talk about like mainstream film and the unrealistic expectations that certain sex scenes in cinema help to set. I mean, there are lots of different factors, but I do think cinema can hold itself responsible for this um, idea that, you know, a woman just, you know, look at the old James Bond films, you know, they just have to look at him and then they drop their dresses, you know. And um, and, and this, this kind of idea of sex scenes where a woman just kind of orgasms, you know, just at the drop of a hat. And all these 
you know, all these incredibly unrealistic portrayals of you know the dynamics in the bedroom i think all contribute in a negative way to the development of young men's minds and their expectations and i think i think that's why talking about responsible depictions in cinema is so important because it has a very real life consequences so where do you think the the films we mentioned before the sort of um, renewal of the the noir genre in the, the 90s where do you feel they sit uh, in that respect I think it's like films like Basic Instinct. Yeah, Basic example. Instinct, I think, is an example of, of a probably not very positive one. I mean, I watched it again the other day and it actually plays out much more like a spoof now than it did then. Because it's, <laughs> it's got, I, I think th- there was a trend in the 90s for that very heightened um, sort of thriller um, where, where it seemed somehow more credible, but now it just, it really does play like a spoof. Um, but but it's, I know it was meant to be a bit of a Hitchcock you know tribute to Hitchcock in many ways um but, but on the one hand so from a feminist perspective on the one hand you've got a woman who is completely in control um she's running rings around the men they are foolish putty in her hands um her chief rival is also a, a very capable psychotherapist and yet there's there's a horrible um basically rape scene with the psychotherapist played by Jean Triplehorn and that is very very troubling um and clearly the women in this case are being sexualized and the sex scenes are eroticized and it's basically a fetish situation. Uh, yeah, and many of these women resemble dominatrixes in the way they behave. And I think basic instincts is, is no exception. And, and it's interesting that a lot of, you know, a lot of this is before mainstream porn, you know, porn was readily available and the mainstream was just coming to be that way online porn. So, so I think there's, there's a link there between the, the, you know, that erotic thriller, but I think basic instinct is probably the worst example of these. I'm, I'm interested in, in the positives of uh, the last seduction, which came out um, a couple of years later in 1994, Mm -hmm. written by a man, but I think brilliantly written. Um, And um, I've, I've interviewed uh, one of the female producers and she, she and the writer, Steve Barantic, really did have a very clear vision for this independent, um, very, very clever woman, played brilliantly played by Lindsay yeah. Fiorentino. And yes, OK, she's an absolute criminal. Um, no, no one should be looking to her for, you know, life advice. But I think because of the situation that women were and still are in, in the patriarchy, the, one of the reasons that I and many other women responded to that film is because we were so delighted mm. to see a woman who was thoroughly in control, absolutely um, owning her life, owning her sexuality as well. Um, so I do think there were a lot of positives in that film for women, and I don't think it mm. was strictly male gaze. Um, and then to move to To Die For in 1995, Gus Van Sant's film starring Nicole Kidman, who always, by the way, makes really interesting choices, I think, when it comes to female mm-hmm. sexuality. Um, again, her character was, it was, she's beautiful, but I think it was more about her ambition, her cold, naked ambition, and her yeah. willingness to exploit the patriarchal world she finds herself in. And it was actually quite an interesting exploration of, what, what do you have to do to get on TV when you're a woman in this world? And the answer is sell your soul um, and possibly your body. Um, yeah, which, uh, you know, another dispiriting take, but also very entertaining. Um, but, I, but I think we've yeah. moved on since then. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, um, well, funnily enough, it made me think, um, in contrast to these films, I wanted to just mention the casting. So to much uh, there's much furore around the uh, article I think it was in front of Variety that that described uh, Carrie Mulligan as uh, not sexy enough for that particular role and I thought I, I disagreed because I actually thought she was just right because anything else would have been a, probably caricature and probably would have been sort of in the vein of something like Basic Instinct I think um, so I was interested to see what you thought of yeah not only Carrie Mulligan's casting in that role, uh, but the choice of men who are mostly comedy actors that are famously quite funny and likable, especially I'm thinking of Bo Burnham, who plays uh, Ryan, her, sort of her, I guess, boyfriend in the film, uh, who uh, the, the man she went to college with, to medical college with, that bumps into her again years later. So he... 
um, I don't know if you know this, um, and I didn't have to, to look him up, but he became really famous on YouTube as a teenager because he's a very talented musician and singer, and he's very, very funny. I thought the casting was very intelligent for that film, and it was, I think it was intentional to have someone like Carey Mulligan play her. I don't know if you if you felt that as well. I totally agree. Uh, incidentally, Bo Burnham was the very first man and one of very few men to come onto Girls on Film podcast because oh, because he not only is, as you say, very funny, but he, he made a fantastic film called Eighth Grade about a young girl. And it was such a nuanced, um, such an empathetic portrayal that we broke our own rule and we, we invited him on. So he really is a great talent and, and a friend of women. He's basically a feminist. Um, so, <laughs> yes, that makes his casting very surprising. Um, I did have a few, and I thought that was clever, but I did have a few issues with the way their romance played out. Um, I, I found it a bit this montage scene kind of sickly sweet maybe it was meant to be that way maybe maybe it was just the tone didn't come across um but th she's also cast quite a lot of nice guy heartthrob roles you know ordinary um looking actors who you know play as you say the boy next door as culprits which i thought was really really important so carrie's casting um she's good friends with them on for now so that's no great surprise but um <laughs> But you know, I yes, I thought it was interesting because when I first watched it, um, as a as a you know aficionado of the likes of Basic Instinct, I did have a slight first jarring reaction, almost like that variety writer who got so much stick because she isn't the typical, uh, you know, only she's beautiful, but she doesn't quite have that um, dark, dangerous yeah. model looks thing going on. Um, but um, actually, as you said, I think it works because she is not that type she isn't then sexualized particularly for the male viewer she isn't held up as this dominatrix figure she is just um a, a lovely attractive woman who is basically dressing up in costumes becoming other people she's acting a part every night so it's almost like she as a character has been inspired by the movies we're talking about arguably um, which is an interesting thought. Um, so I, th I thought she was good, and I thought that whole variety hoo-ha opened up a lot of issues we probably don't have time to discuss here about criticism and about freedom of speech and about male and female critics, but it was certainly interesting. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I to be fair, I, I read the article before having um, seen the film, and my first instinct was, was to think, yeah, he's probably, I can see where he's coming from because in my mind, I had I had all those films from the 90s um, come to me where you're right, there's this kind of, and I couldn't quite uh, pinpoint what I meant to myself by that, but I think there is a type in those films where the women tend to be, I think, very tall, very dominating. Um, and she has this kind of childlike look about her um, and she tends to play I think to it she tends to play fairly innocent young characters um and then having watched the film I thought right I can actually I think this is this is better because it, it would have been a bit over the top probably otherwise um and I don't think it would have served its purpose um Sakura I don't know what did you make of the casting were you quite familiar with some of the actors I was not familiar with any of them no oh, really? so I did not <laughs> No, I wasn't. They looked familiar, but I couldn't place it in the films you're mentioning. I've never seen them, so no, I don't. I don't think I was. But it, it Adam right Adam to me. Brody, he was very well known in the uh, when we were younger, and the he was in the OC. Well, see, I didn't watch that show. I refused to watch it. Um, <laughs> they didn't have any black characters on there, so I refused to. Let me let me. I'm googling it though. OC. See, I'm looking at him. He doesn't. Yeah, I never saw him on that show. Was he the poor one? No, he was the rich one. The poor one's actually a very, very good actor. Uh, I've seen him oh, something great. else since then. Okay, yeah, no, I, I wasn't familiar. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what did you make of... Uh, had you seen Carrie Mulligan in anything else? Uh, no, no. But but one thing I will say, because I'm sure we need to move on to the to the other film, was that I, I, I think they did a really interesting setup. Even though I agree, I thought that montage, I was just like, what are they doing here? Uh, but... <laughs> I like how we were drawn into this relationship because even then from those beginnings, I think they drew hints that there was something up with him because of the way he was really, he was harassing her. If we think about it, I mean, Bill Maher, even though I, I think he's horrible, I hate to that. I, I like his comedy because I think he's a horrible person, but I do actually like his comedy. And he has this joke about romantic comedies 
and how a man keeps harassing the woman into a date, but and we accept it in a film, but in real life, that's stalking. We wouldn't like that if someone we've expressed that we're not interested and they keep showing up and badgering us into a date. And he did that. And we were willing to accept it because we're like, oh, maybe she needs to let go and let somebody in and give a man a chance. And that was a sign, though, that he did not accept her boundaries, that she said she wasn't interested. And instead, he bullied her. But so you then, see, I, I, it's not I too coincident. Well, what do you mean you don't know? I don't know. Because You're saying I, that. You, as no, I was watching, no, as I was watching this, I thought, I thought, mm, what? Yeah, I did think when he uh, pushed her when in the coffee shop, when he really kind of insisted, but I thought... <sighs> I don't know. I mean, where do you draw the line? Elite, like, fair where, where enough. You could have just said line. no. But, okay, <laughs> stop. You, you, we both know. Let's frame it as someone who you're not interested in. So don't think about it as, oh, I don't know him and he's kind of cute. Maybe I would date him. No, no, no. Look at it through the frame of you're at work, no less. She's not at a bar. Yeah. She's yeah. at work. And first he's condescending like, oh, you're working in a coffee shop? Gross. Why are you in medical school? What are you doing here? And he can't even backpedal on that properly and just come out and apologize and say, oh, you know what? That was really, you know, I, my, you know, I apologize. He couldn't say something as simple as that. He had to put his foot in his mouth and keep going and then come back to her job. So think about someone who you don't mm-hmm. like. But that's why we were drawn into that. And then they do the montage and they pull us in like, oh, he's this great guy. And then we see he's he's not so much. He really is part of that group that she claimed she didn't like. And he was very yeah. much a part of that. And even sh- she didn't want to see the truth because how is it that all these people, you know, according to her double crossed, she and her friends, they weren't there for her. Um, And yet he was still friends with them and she never made the connection that clearly he was part of that world. I guess she could have, she could have thought, well, he was just sort of, on the fringes of that group you know fairly naive didn't really know the ins and outs that's what she had to tell herself but all evidence pointed to no he still hung out with them like he was still friendly with them and not at a distance that oh i just see them at the medical school reunion no Mm -hmm. he met up with them so birds of a feather that there's a reason that's a saying birds of a feather but she didn't want to see and we all do so i'm not saying she's different than that lord knows that you can't get in a relationship unless you lie to yourself about about who they are And that's how you read the montage, I guess. Anna, what did you make of, of him asking her out in a fairly pushy way, I guess? I think Sakura's made a really good point because I think that was one of the reasons I then resented the romance and didn't really believe it. Because I was like, mm. I actually thought, is she playing a game and dating him as part of her research and as part of her, the way to get you know, to the, the bad guys? I actually wasn't sure it was meant to be a real romance. And then it was like, oh, OK, we are actually meant to think that she likes him. Because, as you say, you know, that kind of behavior, it's not very attractive, <laughs> you know, not not listening to a no. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I do think that was possibly a flaw with the film. But some people, interestingly, I heard a podcast where a man was saying he thought that was one of the most romantic scenes he's ever seen. So that's interesting. Oh, but that's dear. it. That's it. You see, I'm not surprised, but I do think it reveals a lot about my own skewed boundaries. It's that I would tempt my instinct and it's awful, but I would... And I do wonder why, but I would have sympathy sympathy for someone like that. I'd kind of feel sorry for them. I'd feel like, well, it probably takes a lot of balls to do that. Um, you know, I'll at least humor them a bit. But she did humor him. Let's not forget, yeah. she did the classy thing, which in my opinion, I think that's what people should do to save someone's dignity. Is She gave him a wrong number. So then everyone spectating will think, okay, I actually gave him a phone number. You've saved them from shame. And then they come back because the number was wrong. It's like, take a hint. <laughs> I am an adult. I can give you, <laughs> or even a young woman, right? And we started doing that as teenagers. And I, I felt like back in the day, people appreciated that. Like, thank you for not embarrassing me in front of my friends, you know? But these days, people try to put the number in while you're standing there. It's like, <laughs> get a, I mean, I'm, I'm actually shocked And then they miscall you. It. That's the problem. Exactly. And they, well, well, that's the thing. Look, technology, I'll, I just block as I walk away. Like, people think they're getting away with something. And it's not necessary. And all I'm saying is, I think we're socialized, though, to do that, just like I think we're socialized to see that as sweet and romantic, as the Bill Maher joke yeah. was saying. And then it's like, well, why don't we ever see that as fun? No. But then no. also, there's the other side of that where we're also taught it's acceptable to play this game. Like, if you're interested in someone, you can't be too eager. Why not? Just mm. what's wrong with eager yeah. and showing someone you're interested? <laughs> and instead, there's this dance you have to do with, like, I want to see him interested but not like i don't have a lot of options so let's try to strike the balance here but she went full throttle and gave him a wrong number so he he knew what was up and yet 
someone can still see that and say, oh, he didn't give up because he always liked her. Yeah, God, but that's such a recurring motif in films. It is. It's rom-com stuff. So, yeah, yeah, we're used to it. Even, uh, what's that film? That really kind of one of the few rom-coms I like, My Best Friend's Wedding from the 90s with Julia Roberts. Uh, Yeah, we thought that was funny, too, that she was trying to break up his wedding. But then it's like, ooh, that's... (laughs) almost kind of taking us into the next film but that's horrible that someone thinks that they know better than someone else and they'll go out of their way to break them up after they've been invited to support the relationship (laughs) that's a good point um by next film i mean i I assume you mean um i blame society i do wait but before we do that just one more thing i did want to say though i know we're running kind of late here i did not like how she was a bit arbitrary right because the lawyer she forgave him just because he was very remorseful. You know, he's begging her for forgiveness. Yeah. But it's like, well, why is then that about forgiveness and not justice? Because I think you can have both and one doesn't negate the other. So just because you forgive someone and you're ready to move on, that still means that they don't face any justice. And she had the hitman right there or whatever. We don't know what she had planned for him, but I don't Mm -hmm. know why he got out of it just because he was remorseful. Meanwhile, her, should we call him boyfriend? Because at that point he was, she doesn't accept his apology because he apologized before he lashed out. And that seemed genuine to me, he, even though he gave the excuses. Oh, I was a kid. I think he did feel like uh, I even forgot about it because I'm not that person anymore. That could have been possible, but she wouldn't even entertain that because he wasn't groveling on his knees. It's like, okay, so yeah. why is forgiveness not good enough for him? But it is for the lawyer. And because this you man could, can because give the lawyer you a come up clearly he's paid, a doctor. paid a price for this. He's clearly been through the emotional uh, a lot of emotional turmoil. He's not sleeping at night, and so on. So you feel like, okay, he's oh, he's please. paid his dues. I think it's it's a hard one. What would justice look like then? Well, the she decided that she's already beating people up and smashing car windows. I mean, I don't know what she had in mind. And she set the other girl up to, <laughs> to make her think she'd been raped, and she had the other woman think her daughter was going to be raped. So I don't know what she was going to do. So it was she wants to traumatize people. So justice in her mind looks it's pretty left field, but nevertheless, I don't think he should have gotten out of it if we wanted some consistency with her. So I just don't know why she had a soft spot for him all of a sudden. That just didn't seem out in character. It's like, well, why doesn't know, your know, boyfriend do you get make the same? It? I actually thought, I felt quite sorry for the lawyer. Oh gosh. I, I was kind of glad that she let him off, but at the same time, I do see that there's an inconsistency there, but then people are people, you know, I mean, this, this one didn't have the time to go into great depths about character. So I think, what it offered is conversation topics, which is certainly has delivered today. So, you know, I, I love that it's raised that discussion between us. Which, uh, no, there's no way to segue elegantly into this. <laughs> um, but you uh, also mentioned the more recent film, I Blame Society, as part of that sort of new genre you wanted to explore. Um, so how did that come about? How how did you, why, why did that film um, come into your mind when you thought of uh, Bubble Gum Noir? Well, I Blame Society, I would put as a slight offshoot of this, but I think it very much belongs to the female reclaiming of the femme fatale. Um, So this is written and directed, low budget film by Gillian Wallace Horvat, who has a very darkly comic street. She also stars as a woman who, um, it's, it's a long story, but basically her friends tell her that she'd make a good murderer. So she decides to make a documentary um, explaining how and why she would murder people. Then she decides, you know what, let's just go one better and actually do it. But uh, the victims she chooses are, um, as you hinted at earlier, Scott, is, it, you know, she, she's, she hates, absolutely hates the girlfriend of one of her friends. And it becomes clear that's because she fancies the guy. So this is very, very dark, very difficult area and by no means is she a likable character but this is also something which is fascinating about the film is that they tackle head on the idea of a likable or unlikable female lead and this is a film within a film and when when she's having meetings with men about you know making films it's very clear they just want to hire her as a token hire and they're not interested in an unlikable female lead um and and in a way I, i blame society is showing that when you have a murderous female lead if she's not sexy and shown through a male lens then maybe it's not going to be as successful and maybe a lot of people are going to have a problem with that so I think it explores a lot of the issues that we are discussing and is also very funny I thought it is very funny yeah so Cara what did you make of it I liked it um and that's so funny you say that I didn't pick up that she liked him (laughs) 
I thought she was contr- a controlling cow. Yeah, I did not pick up that she liked him. And maybe it's because I've had friends like that in my life who are very, and I've, I found it bizarre, I must say, but I've never, you know, I'm not very good with analyzing people's motivations or intention or even exploring that. I'm always just like, God, I don't want to have that conversation to reflect with you for a few hours about why you're doing something. And yet, so when she just did that, his her whole thing coming out with all the reasons why she didn't like his girlfriend and she turned out to be right because the girlfriend didn't like her um i just thought she was being inappropriate and bossy and controlling i did not take that hint that she was interested in him but it would explain her her blow up uh finding out he was getting married so that makes sense <laughs> yeah i think it was strongly hinted i wouldn't say you know it was stated but that's what i got from it i did abla did you get that from it uh I had a friend Not that, that overly, happened to I, she once. Uh, she really? was, yeah, she had roommates and she always hated the girlfriend of one of them. And then they broke up and it was her friend who said, you know, you hate his girlfriend because you're interested in him. And they're married now with kids. So that was true. <laughs> that, um, that was the reason she hated her. But, but she had a reason for disliking her because apparently she said something to her. Um, so, but it could also be, and I've, found that with friends I've had who are men and they do the right thing by stop to stop being friends with me because you should definitely always choose a relationship over a friendship but girlfriends who just like me dislike me for no particular reason and there's plenty of reasons to dislike me but it's very random very immediate and clearly they feel I'm a threat well I'm sure you've experienced that with men friends where a few of them will have girlfriends who just hate that they have women friends I never have. <laughs> don't know what that oh, says about Oh, you have it? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, no, it, it, it's a thing. <laughs> and they're right to do that, though, because there are some, I don't think it's typical, but I think there are some men-women friendships where they just haven't had time to date, but they would given the opportunity. And so that is a threat to a relationship, I think. But I did like the film. I thought she was very funny, but she was she was horrible. The fact that she would plan that out and she felt so comfortable telling him, yeah, so what we could do is come to your house. And then she gave all the reasons why she was a horrible person and deserved to die. It was just so. <laughs> and I like that they did it at the very beginning of the film. So you go yeah. in not liking her. And that's a, a thing that keeps um, recurring. And then also I found s- similar to Promising Young Woman, it, there were these women who weren't fitting their roles because what she should have been doing in both cases, right? They were at the age where they should be married, starting to have children, be professionals. They both have degrees. So it's like, why aren't they doing that? And they kind of create a problem for society. It's like, well, what do we do with people mm-hmm. like that? Yeah, that's interesting, actually. I'm trying to think back to the other films we mentioned. Because that's... to me, that's why I thought she was blaming society because it's like, how dare you produce these creatives who have a vision and something to say, and no one will produce their films. You don't even have a big, you know, huge philanthropy fund to allow people to be creative. So you set her up where she has no choice except, you know, she has two options, right? Either go into an industry where she won't be able to create the kind of film she wants, or she can like most people just forget your dream (laughs) and drink and pretend like you never have them because they were never realized. That's an interesting point, actually. Thinking of the other films, they tend to be, um, they don't, they tend not, I mean, I'm I'm generalizing probably here, uh, so uh, do uh, tell me, but it's the main, the female protagonists tend not to have children, but they tended to be professionals. They tended to be, to have sort of high flying careers and be quite well off. 100%. Yeah, that yeah. that's that is definitely. I think if you go right back to the you know thirties and forties film noir, that was often um, you know perceived as a particularly dangerous woman who wasn't the wife at home. She wasn't the maternal caring type. You even look at some um, fairy tales, and you know the wicked stepmother who didn't have children of her own. You know, it's yeah. it's a real kind of you know a primal fear. Um, but of course, you know, hopefully has been now harnessed in modern times by you know filmmakers who are celebrating people's choice to be child free or to to delay having children or whatever um but yeah that's definitely a good point and 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 an absolute theme and all yeah all these women are ambitious career women with the exception of promising young women actually but she was initially yeah. before she was cut down in her plan yeah but that's that's it the last two films we mentioned well first of all i mean they're directed by women so i don't know if that that means anything in this context but they're not um yeah th- th- they uh, 
they aren't successful. I mean, I read success how you want, but traditionally successful uh, professionally. They're not making that much money um, in promising young women. She's really living with her parents who seem to be very well off. Um, and and I wonder whether and the the thing that that they they don't have kids that doesn't seem to be something that's worth even mentioning. I mean, that's not part of their the way they're portrayed. It doesn't seem to say anything about their personalities as opposed to sort of older films. Um, but I do wonder whether this, uh, in terms of women filmmakers, this uh, this trope of kind of high-flying, ambitious women, just it, it that doesn't cut the mustard with them. It just doesn't, uh, it's not something that, that they want to put forward as a, as a, as a character. They're yeah. not interested in exploring that version of, of women. Well, they're drawing from real life. I mean, I interviewed Gillian Wallace Holbert for I Blame Society on the podcast. And, you know, she is that person. She's a struggling, well, she's not a murderer, I'm happy to say, but she's <laughs> a struggling filmmaker who's had exactly those kind of meetings with male executives. And she's like yeah. incredibly frustrated. Um, you know, she's she's made this movie on a shoestring. You know, she she knows what it's like to be a woman, you know, as you're saying, you know, struggling to, to sort of break through into a man's world. Um, and I and I find that much more interesting actually to watch, and I'm sure a lot more women can relate to it. Um, but yeah, there's still it still has the the trappings and the excitement of a traditional thriller in many ways. Yeah, but I'm I do think more... though, I, in promising young women, even though that was the thing, she was working at a coffee shop, but she didn't have to because in the U.S being a doctor's postgraduate. So she already has some postgraduate education because she started medical school, but she didn't finish. So bare bones, she has a degree. And even her, it, it was bizarre because even her, the coffee shop manager wanted to promote her, even though she didn't do her own job well. So that just shows the privilege. <laughs> it's like, you don't have to do one job well to get promoted to something else because I think it was her status in education. Like, well, you don't belong here. So we have to find a place for you to belong. And that was her thing. She's like, well, I don't, want to do that so I think even that is a place of privilege because the fact that she had her parents to fall back mm -hmm. on and even though they wanted her to move out they did it in a very passive aggressive way nobody was forcing her out of the house which they probably would have done if she was a man and and I blame society her boyfriend was supporting her because even in that scene where someone because I actually it was funny I couldn't figure out what she did and it wasn't until she met the first guy and he said so what is that you do <laughs> she could, she could really explain well and she did seem to be home a lot so I don't think she worked I think her boyfriend supported her and then when she kicked him out I'm assuming her family paid her bills so that's also privilege to just not have to work yeah, and I think, you know, something you referred to earlier is that, you know, I'm very conscious that all the films I've picked do star white women. And I do think that that is actually a, another issue with the genre, obviously, that, you know, it's we, we've tackled this on the podcast, you know, to talk about a lack of intersectional feminism in, in, it's in I Blame Society and Promising Young Women. These are very privileged white women at the centre. So I think the, the genre has got a long way to go before it's uh, suitably inclusive and, uh, you know, something that people identify with through Fully. I think it would be interesting. The, the the issue of class would be interesting to if if a film revisited those tropes, but with a genuinely sort of poor woman, a, a woman who's you know struggling with three jobs and struggling to pay the bills. Well, how would um, you plan? A mur like, how would you, have you plan a murder? Because the problem is, <laughs> you could murder, but you have to murder for something, right? So, you know, if you're a, a low you know, working class or poor woman, I'm going to assume that your partner doesn't have a big life insurance policy. What would be your incentive? <laughs> You're better off letting him live. You, you know what I mean? Actually, I don't know if either of you have seen this because I watch murder mysteries to procrastinate and there's one deadly women and she does women all throughout history. And sometimes you do have these social climbing women who marry into wealth just to kill them and get their money. So yeah, that could be a good uh, film. Well, to Certainly. die for is sort of slightly in that area, oh, right. I would say. Yeah, she's not a privilege. You know, she's very it's much true, a working yeah. class woman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true, actually. Yeah. yeah, trying to make her way into an industry. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. But it was that question, too, I had for both of them. It's like, it, was there also something about you having to be, even though they're white women, right? So having to be a white woman in this in betwixt, in between place where you're not choosing what you're doing? Because they're both about 30. I'm guessing um, I blame the yeah. society. She was almost 30 because she said they had been in school 10 years ago. So I was guessing she's about that. So yes, they're both about 30. And that's the time where you have to decide, okay, what is it that I'm doing? Am I going to be this high flying career woman? It seems like both of them have that option. So she could have been the token at the film production company. She just didn't want to do that, but she did have that path or she could have 
had she not gone on her killing spree, I'm sure married her boyfriend and had kids. So it's like they, they, they were just at that cusp where you had to decide in saying something that that's dangerous to be in that place because left alone to your own devices, you'll start doing things <laughs> very, you know, you'll kind of fall into this deviant behavior. I love that choice. Mm. Uh, get married and have kids or go on a killing spree. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there are other choices, but yeah. <laughs> No, that that seems like that's that's what it was. So it's like being in that place and almost like the indecisiveness forced them to say, OK, well, then I have to do something uh, very deviant. But I did like that they didn't rely on them having some sort of. Uh, what's the word? I guess mental illness that would just force them to do that. They were always trying to explain, make it seem rational and show the rationality and in I Blame Society, you see her on the path where she seems like, even though that was, you know, it, it was funny as well, the first scene. And so you think, okay, she's inappropriate and quirky, but she's not crazy. But then midway, you're just like, oh my God, <laughs> she is crazy because she refuses to accept that, no, it's not okay to kill someone, even if, <laughs> even if you've decided that they're bad. <laughs> it's like, very, so very juvenile. Almost like an arrested development where she couldn't get why someone would find that a problem. So it was funny. They kind of took yeah. you on the journey and drew you further and further in to her way of seeing things. I don't know if they did that. It worked because you they had the camera. And so you were always kind of seeing her, seeing her as she was seeing herself or what. But I think they took you along that path. We almost didn't want her mm-hmm, to get yeah. caught, even though she was the worst. Yeah, you, you tend not to. You tend to side with the protagonist. Well, not um, always, because she wasn't likable. And they kept reiterating that point when people would come across <laughs> the, whatever she wrote. This isn't very likable. No, but you want to see where she pu- how, how far she pushes it, really. So we have just under five minutes left, maybe by way of uh, conclusion. Where do we think this genre is headed? What sort of, I guess, developments and nuances have the, the most recent films brought to it? Um, Anna, what do you think? Well, I think the success of Promising Young Woman bodes really well for more work in this area and hopefully more nuanced work in this area. And it's worth noting that Promising Young Woman was supported by Margot Robbie and her production company, which was set up with her partner specifically to spotlight female filmmakers and to support them. And I would say, incidentally, Margot Robbie and and some of her work in films like Birds of Prey kind of set that bubble gum noir tone as well. So I think I'd keep a close eye on what she's up to. Um, And I think the very fact that you know we saw emerald you know you know female directors nominated for oscars um more people are going to start putting money into female directed films of this genre so i'm hopeful because i really enjoy it when it's done well i'm hopeful Mm -hmm. that it will get more funding and audiences will continue to support it and we will see it evolve in a much as as i suggested in in a much sort of less contained way and a way that tackles people from all walks of life um, thank you. Sakura, do you have any last words to say? Just I recommend both of them. Um, I thought, especially, I think I might, may have liked I Blame Society more because she was so unapologetic. And I like that people who just dig their heels in and they don't have an arc where they change. Um, especially one of the closing scenes where she told her um, friends, I don't know if we can call her a widow because they didn't get married, but she told her she'd see her in hell. <laughs> She could have helped her in her morning and she refused to do it. And I love that. So lots of fun. I suggest watching that one first and uh, then Promising Young Women, although they were both good. So watch them. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I thought they were quite strong films. Um, and yeah, very well cast in both cases. Uh, thank you so much uh, both for this conversation. Thank you very much, Anna, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> absolute pleasure on our part uh, thank you very much for listening you can obviously tweet us send us comments and feedback on twitter at my or write to us via our website mydialorama.org.uk have a lovely week everyone <laughs>